boot camp. So we've spoken about calibration in the course of this boot camp. Um, we've spoken about it um, by reference to MCMC techniques. Um, in contrast to what we get out of particle filtering with regards to PMCMC as combining both of those features. Um, calibration is a process that like those uh, approaches we often apply following model formulation to try to pin down the value of model parameters. Um, and often the motivation for doing so is whilst we have data related to particular pieces of the model very specifically that can lend parameter estimates for, for behavior at particular sub-pieces of the system, often we have data that relates to um, the behavior of the system as a whole. And uh, this data can't be reduced to any one piece of the system. Indeed, it results from the interaction of many pieces of the system. And so we can't take just this observed data and plug it in directly to the model. We can't, we can't take it and say to the, to the model, make this happen. Because this, this relates to model output, to what the model is generating. Parameter estimates are things we tell to the model. And the model will take them into account in terms of the assumptions, its assumptions. By contrast, these models that we simulate, as we saw in that very first session, the very first day from this very pulpit, models are designed to generate output, to put, to, to over time output information. We saw those graphs on the very first day that related distance that I live to a grocery store or that I live to a, to a convenience store, the ratio of that distance on the one hand to my weight. That was generated by the model. We can't impose a distribution for it because the model is generating that. And when we have these models and many sources of data from the world, often we we have a, a desire to, to leverage what we do know about the world in terms of emergent behavior, in terms of the patterns that we see related to model outputs that will let us match, that will, and, and, and we want to use that data to inform our model, to, to help guide us, say, to the value of model parameters which we don't, don't know, okay? And, um, Calibration can be seen as taking many diverse lines of evidence and kind of triangulating the assumptions of the model of, regarding model parameters to try to tune them so the model best matches what data we observe from the world. MCMC is very similar. MCMC is, similar, is, is simulating drawing from distributions um, associated with those parameters joint distribution saying it could be this, it could be that, this is also likely. The ones that are very likely are simulated more frequently. In calibration, we're, we get out a single point estimate for these parameters that best match the observed data. And the idea is to try to get the calibration software, say Venson or any logic, to say what must the value of less known parameters be in order to simultaneously match all these different sets of data. Um, we have data from the world. We can't put it into a parameter because it results from the tangled, entangled output of the model, which reflects an entanglement of many parameters. And we want to get the model, model's output to align most closely with uh, the data from the world. Um, and we want to do it by adjusting less well-known parameters. Okay, um, and so typically this is model output that's emergent from the model. The model's producing it, the model generates it, and we try to match it against this observed data. And done properly rightly, this is a learning process. It's a process by which you learn about the models. It's not just a process where you turn the crank, 
and you find the parameter values that let you best match, and then you march onwards. It's something that you learn about what the model can and cannot do often. You learn about what things it's sensitive to. You learn what just won't cut it in terms of an explanation for the observed data. What things you have to vary about your assumptions. Which is exactly what we seek often to learn from models. To sharpen our thinking. To, to help us think with greater clarity about what explanation is needed in terms of particular specifics, the particular assumptions about the model, so that we, um, we can account for the empirical data we do see. Um, so calibration uh, can help us find reasonable specifics for a dynamic hypothesis that observes today. We're assigning values to certain parameters and can help us leverage the large amount of, of information we have about emergent data in the, in the world. And it can help us falsify, uh, falsify models, undercut models, challenge models. So the way in which calibration works is to use a global optimization algorithm which adjusts our assumption on parameter values to match many sources of data that we might want to compare against model output. And the data, which is sometimes in the form of time series, um, basically is the thing we're trying to match. We're trying to get the model to match it as close as possible. Sometimes it's over time, sometimes it's not. And we want the model to, to try to match it. And this optimization algorithm will run the model many times, thousands or more often, sometimes hundreds, but I recommend thousands, to try to find, to try to adjust those parameters that are le less well known so that the model output matches this observed data. In other words, so that our theory as captured by the model is as consistent as possible with the observed data. Okay? Um, so in order to run calibration, you need to specify a couple things. What to match, what data you're going to match from the world. Um, you need to specify what parameters to vary over what range to vary them and how you want it to adjust those parameters. This often comes with, with the software. Um, and uh, this specification of, of how to match, that's something which will often um, also draw on the software's abilities. So the idea here is that we might have multiple parameters. And we'll often talk about parameter space. This is different than state space. Space, space is the you know, state depicting the possible situations in the model as it evolves. And as it evolves, we'll arc out something in state space. Here, for parameter space, a given run of the model will be at a specific location. And we'll assume a specific thing for each of these parameters, mu, beta, and tau. It will assume something specific. These parameter names are not specific. Sometimes we'll have two parameters. Sometimes we'll have five. Sometimes we'll have eight that are, that are uh, being thought about in calibration. And the point is we're adjusting our assumptions about them to best match that data. Okay. Now, I'd like to take a break from this for a moment to make sure that we all thank Christine for her incredible work and making this possible to keep our things together and in keeping me sane. <laughs> okay, maybe I did more than I thought. <laughs> I'll see you at work next week. Yeah, thank you, thank Bye, you, guys. thank you. So grateful. You have a good long weekend. Yeah, thanks, thanks a ton. Okay, so we're trying to adjust these parameters to get it to match the, the data, often historic data, empirical data, as closely as possible. Okay? Um, and in so doing, we will often make use of uh, a matching function that needs certain characteristics. Uh, there's a whole art to this, but fundamentally, software pack, you'll find me speaking about this online, you can look at it. Um, but software packages typically provide easy ways of specifying how do you want to match a model against the observed data, whether it's any logic or et etc. Any logic provides a, a function called difference, which will allow you to take the difference between the observed data and uh, what's output by the model. Okay. Um, now um, we'll sometimes weight the data. 
up-weighting data that's considered more important, down-weighting data that's considered uh, less important. Um, now, in the calibration process, it's adjusting parameters to get it to match the observed data as well as possible. And there's a whole art for how to adjust the most effectively so that it doesn't, um, it doesn't provide some that actually, in, in fact, are really suboptimal, that it misses whole areas of, of possible assumptions where it would match really well. So um, that's taken care of by the software. It uses what are called global optimization algorithms. And what's very important is that it run enough iterations of the calibration to not miss big areas where it really should be uh, exploring in this parameter space. That it, it will give you something that's a preliminary answer. It can do a lot better if it continued. So you really want to run several thousand iterations, typically, within calibration. You want to run it to try to find the best parameters having going through thousands of times. Just like an MCMC, you want to sample tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times to get a good set of, 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 of samples. Um, and uh, generally, the, the software will have mechanisms for doing this. Now, I'm not going to go into it, but here, in a, for those who are any logic users, um, in a calibration or in an optimization experiment, I typically just use an optimization experiment. You can specify for parameters the range in which they should be varied and whether they're to be varied on a continuous basis or, or discrete basis. You can specify the number of iterations that you want it to run. I'd again generally suggest in the thousands for, for a um, industrial strength result, but you can run smaller number of iterations for exploratory runs very typically, and that's what we do. Um, and uh, here's this difference function in any logic that allows you to take a difference between two data sets or a data set and table function. Generally, we have a data set which has the historic data on the one hand and a data set which has the data from the model on the other in the experiment. In the experiment, we, we basically um, allow it to say, okay, the objective function is to minimize this difference. It's to minimize the difference between the model's predictions and what's observed. Generally speaking, we'll have, each of these, uh, we'll have one of these data sets for each different type of data we're trying to match. And so we'll typically have a plus another difference here, plus another difference, plus another difference, plus another difference, if we're matching many types of data. So we'll have data sets for the empirical data and for the observed data from the world for each of those, and we'll try to be matching each of those and summing up the results, possibly multiplying each one by certain weights. And this is uh, well, well documented in Inside Any Logic and by many, many of my talks online. Um, okay, uh, there's, I, I, won't, I won't go into that. You can also implement your own difference function, which is, is fine. Um, I give some guidance here on how you can use table functions to store, to store historic data and how you can populate that data into a data set in a way will then let you, uh, let you compare that. Um, any logic, uh, Asian-based models typically have stochastics and to match them against data, we wanna make sure our match, finding the best parameters isn't, isn't um, uh, uh, contingent on or just the result of a fluke of uh, one particular match. In other words, it was just the luck of the draw that we have some specific stochastics that match really well with certain parameters and, and uh, we assume those parameters are correct even though they're not like that, they're not as good on average. So often with calibrating an ABM, we will run what are called many realizations or replications, they're called in any logic, to run the model over and over and over again, um, maybe five times for each set of parameter values, and we see the average match, um, the average objective function compared to the empirical data for each of those replications. And any logic provides uh, a specification of where you can set the replication associated with the optimization experiment. Um, 
it, it provides that. So any logic is a very nice uh, agent-based calibration um, uh, model which they provide and where you can read these things out. Uh, I also provide my um, bootcamp participants with copies of that model which extend it to multiple data sets and I will post one for this, uh, for this bootcamp. Um, their nice uh, model um, uh, presents the objective function for a given match and it keeps track of the best ones so far and adjusts it as it gets a better and match, better match to the observed, uh, observed data. You can also specify constraints on the parameters which are tested before uh, it match, it tries to see is this, are these legitimate parameters? For example, <laughs> if the sum of two of them is greater than one, maybe it will, uh, can't nix that, um, uh, that run before it takes place. You can also have what are called requirements where if the simulation has something occur in it that is unacceptable, you throw it away. And those are occasionally used. We use, we've used them in some calibrations where basically we toss the simulation if it has something totally unreasonable uh, in it as uh, judged by elements. You could see here where you could say use replications in the experiment and um, you can specify to use a fixed number of replications or to have a number of replications which achieves a certain statistical accuracy in terms of the estimating the mean of the, the results. And I won't go into that. Um, uh, and so basically it can throttle the number of replications to achieve a certain observed um, uh, sample mean which has a certain error bar in it. Um, normally we just do a fixed number of replications. Um, okay. Um, and you can report results for each replication. I'll show how to do that here within any logics properties for the optimization experiment. Um, okay, uh, and this uh, provides a, uh, a report here. Um, okay, some considerations with calibration. Um, calibration is, is best used as a process for learning. As I argued before, um, computers, the purpose of computing, to quote Hastings or Haskell, I forget which, is, is insight, not numbers. And best used, you learn from calibrations over time as you run them. You try to match the model's results against empirical results in the world, not as just a road bump, you know, a speed bump to, to go on. It's to learn how the model thinks, what it's doing, when you give it certain parameters, what the results are. You learn why it has trouble matching the empirical data with certain types of parameters. Um, you might think you can do better than it with assuming parameters, and you should try that and see, is the objective function in B lower? If it's giving weird results, challenge it by giving something you think is better and observe, is it indeed a better value of the objective function? If it's not, you learn something about why it's having trouble matching the empirical data. If it is better in terms of matching the empirical, uh, in terms of the objective function, you learn basically that it is, uh, it, it has not run for long enough. Uh, so a lot of calibration best used consists of seeing does this, do these hypotheses that captured in the parameter values allow us to explain the data that we observe historically? Does it lead the model to output data that's consistent with the evidence? And if not, maybe it's consistent, for example, with some evidence, but not others. That tells you something about why that hypothesis doesn't cut it. It's because it jives with this and not with that. And through that, we arrive at an, an understanding. Barbara McClintock once said, you know, to be a good biologist, you need to get a feeling for the organism, what it wants, what it's seeking, you know, um, what it needs to, to grow, etc. And I would argue to be a really good modeler, you need to get a feeling for the model. You need to get a sense of what its needs are, what um, what it has ten what tensions there are in matching the observed data. You need to you need to figure out 
Why is it matching this but not that? What is it about that's inherent about the, about the constraints in the model that allow you to only match one of these data sets really well? Getting that insight gives you kind of um, the, you, you kind of grok what, what the model um, is, is hypothesizing about the world and whether it's not consistent with the world. An example would be Tina's model for HIV where it's, it's working with CD4 counts and, uh, and viral load levels and she's got empirical data that doesn't seem to jive with the model's depictions and knowing why, you know, why does it have trouble having this high and that high will help you understand the model mechanism, the mechanics of, of what it's depicting better and understand the fundamental constraints. Ultimately, it may cause you to expand the model. It may say, I mean, I, I, I remember this for a case of TB. Um, I was trying to match TB data, and I just could not match historical data on TB with an existing model. Unless I took the model and I modified it by, by distinguishing cases of infectious TB and non-infectious TB. And then, and reflecting the fact people are typically with active TB, they're non-infectious, and then they go on and become infectious. Well, once I represented that, the data made sense. I was able to match this data much more effectively. Um, in other cases, you don't learn about the model. You, learn, you, you don't learn about model flaws. You learn, about, well, you learn a lot about the model and how it thinks about the situation and why it can't simultaneously do this and that. But other times what you learn about is flaws in the data. And I remember at least four or five times in my modeling career where I've struggled with calibration. I just can't make it work. And I go and I look into it more by talking with people in the know. And it turns out the standards changed, um, how they measured the data changed, um, their definitions changed, etc. And it turns out that it's not a problem with the model, it's a problem with the data. And that too is a type of learning that comes from modeling. And it's a very important type of modeling, learning that comes from modeling. It's a type of learning about the context that you would not have acquired without a model to, 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 to point it out to you and to, and to say it just doesn't cut it. Something is not right here. And that sort of learning, in my experience, is very helpful as well. So some considerations. If you're adjusting many parameters, you're, you're uh, risking having many possible interpretations. If you're going to adjust many parameters, you need a lot of data to match. It's a simple identifiable thing, just like with statistics. If we have you know, a thousand betas and we only have 30 observations, we're going to be at risk of overfitting and under identifiability. There may be many combinations of betas, value, assignment of betas, values to those betas, which will match. So adding constraints in the form of data helps pin down model values. It'll make it harder to match, but it will make it harder to match. It will constrain it to realistic um, values. So adding parameters to tune, as you add more parameters, it makes it harder for the model to match. You've got to run it for a larger number of iterations. And uh, that will often require quite a bit of extra time when you're running the, the calibrations. Adding too many uh, parameters to tune for a given amount of data can lead to an underdetermined situation. And all fits um, are within the constraints of the model. You're trying to get this model to match the data. And it may be that it just can't match it um, with the current model structure, and you try to expand it. There's a there's a, an art to applying this sort of calibration. Um, you're trying to outsmart the calibration sometimes as part of understanding how it thinks. One of my favorite challenges is I have a calibration I'm not satisfied with. And I ask myself, how do I think I could improve that calibration? 
And you basically take, you say, okay, modeler, so you think you know better than that. Why do you think you can do better than that? And I'll say, well, I think it's really underplaying this parameter. You know, it's, it, it's got too few cases of that. So I'm going to up this certain parameter. And I do that. Maybe I can match more of those cases, but then something else gets worse. Another part of the match gets worse. And I say, oh, I see why it's having problems. I, I, you know, I have this here, and it's like squeezing a balloon here, and it pops out there. OK, now that's pretty interesting. And I didn't think about that before in that way, perhaps. But now I, I know I grok better what the model is representing. And I, I understand, OK, what the logic of the model implies. That's really useful. That's like gold in terms because it's thinking about the situation. Oh, I didn't realize those two were in tension in that way. And then you know I might say, OK. Well, maybe if I adjusted this other parameter, then it could match both. Maybe what's actually going on is there are more people on that stock. And then I start adjusting my assumptions there. Um, and I see, yeah, that does kind of jive better now with those data. But there's this other data set that it's still not matching. But I remember hearing the quality of that was not as good. Maybe, maybe that's actually less of an issue. Maybe I've got to go back to the stakeholders and say, look, you know, should I be worried about this lack of match? So, so there's this all this experimentation process that you got to be trying to try to to try to outsmart it. You say, okay, I think I can do better than that. Let me try this. Let me try that. Try an experiment where I adjust the parameters uh, from what it suggests, and I see and I learn to think like like the model. Um, and uh, this helps us. Um, this helps us learn about what the model constraints are, what the model has got to have to make it happy, um, what it can represent, what it can't easily represent. Or I'll set a very high weight, I'll really highly weight the difference between, um, with respect to issue A, and I'll underweight, and, and, and I'll vastly weight that high, and I see, oh, we can match that really well, but look, it does horribly in matching these other things. Ah, okay. Um, uh, the fox has shown its tail. Um, or I'll set other weights to zero and see, hey, can I, match, um, uh, can I match this one thing really well if it has no other constraints? I love that sort of stuff. It's awesome. Man, if I were a grad student, I'd be all over that. It's, it's, just, it's a lot of fun. You learn how to think like a model. Mm. And if you do really well, you learn how to think like a super model. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, um, so um, additional experiments, you can increase the parameter range. Hey, maybe you notice the parameter is right at the end of its range. It's just in the upper edge of the range you gave it. Maybe it needs to go a bit higher. And why does it want to make it higher? Where, what's it, what is it getting at? And you try running it with a higher value. Oh, oh, yeah, you're, it's right. It, it wants to make that higher because it will help with this. And you try increasing the parameter range, and then maybe other things go against the edge of their range. And you, you got to try to try to sort of work within that. Often that's that's uh, insightful. Increase the number of parameters that you're matching. Uh, do so with caution, but you can do it temporarily and see. Okay, if I let this one vary too, would that match it? Um, try changing model structure. Does that does that help at all? Um, merge these two stocks or break them out separately separately. Um, uh, add this extra characteristic into the agents, what have you. Um, run for a larger number of optimization runs. Uh, that's really good. Run it overnight. Run it overnight. Set one run that runs for an hour. Set one run that runs overnight. Set one run that's running for three days. And whilst you're learning with after the small number of or the shorter runs, the longer run can still be going on. And and then you're confident your results are not all beholden to a short run time. And while you're working, it will still be running. Young Chin is a master of this. She's just great at, at doing these things. And, uh, and it's advised to be thinking about how can I get quick results, but also how can I try it to make sure that I'm just not running so few optimization runs, I, 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 I don't match it just because of that accident. Um, and uh, if there's uncertain parameters, 
that you're varying and you're not really getting good results and you feel you have too many parameters, um, try seeing if you can arrive at, at alternative values for those. Um, you should be asking, um, to some degree, are, are the calibration values unique? Try, try running several different calibrations uh, with different random number seeds. See if you get consistent results. That's a good thing to do. Um, uh, I wish more of my students were here. Uh, come on, folks. Get back down here. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, ways of it, uh, so, so if you have very different interpretations that come out, you have two different parameter values that depict two different hypotheses. This is awesome sometimes. I mean, it may not sound great, but it's really interesting scientifically. Okay, either this could be the case or that one. Can we collect more data that would inform that? You talk about it with system stakeholders, and they say, no, that one's really not feasible. Um, and so then you've, you've learned something uh, pretty interesting. Um, uh, sometimes this is an invitation to, to simplify the model, et cetera. Um, so you should look for calibrated parameters at the end of their permissible range. And, um, and that's suspicious, because it's saying it could probably do even better if it went further. And you should try to, try to understand that um, and potentially challenge um, model structure. Um, uh, there's some clever ways you can do things like have parameter A be at least as big as parameter B by, for example, having a coefficient of the, 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 um, uh, the difference, uh, the, the quotient between them. And you, you make parameter A that coefficient times parameter uh, B and that coefficient only goes from one, um, one and larger. And, and that's, uh, that's a quite easy thing to do. Um, uh, so, and there's some ways of adjusting parameters, so for example, so they sum to one, et cetera. Um, uh, calibrating initial conditions, uh, I say it can be one of the best values to calibrate. You gotta be careful, you don't wanna have your calibration parameters filled with these sort of things. Sometimes it's better just to run a burn-in period, um, but um, these can be good things uh, to calibrate, um, uh, the initial, uh, initial parameters. Um, okay, um, so those are my comments on uh, calibration. I have hours and hours and hours of extra video uh, related to calibration online, where you can find out more detail than I've uh, presented here but I've tried to present some of the, the thinking that goes into calibration. Calibration is not a mechanical process. It's a process of learning. And as such, it's a very valuable part of uh, the modeling process. Can I answer questions on that? Uh -huh. I have a technical question. Why are you using an optimization experiment in your lesson? Because I often am not running with professional version, which has the calibration experiment because I don't think the calibration experiment gives me anything significant beyond that um, for our needs. And thirdly, because I have many students who don't have a professional and I don't want to force them to buy it. I'd like to be able to show it without them having to use professional. Any, ma any logic may not like that. I'm not asking you for yeah. So that, that's why. Um, for, th for other people, um, if you have recourse to professional and you want to use the calibration experiment, um, it's not a bad thing. Um, I think it may simplify certain tasks. Um, uh, we undertake those tasks manually normally, but for people who are not computer scientists, maybe it's a nice thing to have it do automatically. I guess if I were using the professional edition, yeah, I'd probably use um, Calibr I'd probably use uh, the calibration experiment more um, and just be done with that. Uh, an issue of that is I can't show that model at my boot camps because we're not running professional and I, I can't then share it. And sharing models, as you may have noted, is, is one of my um, more enjoyable activities. I have the, just the, I have the university license and it has the. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, those things change over time. I don't like to comment on them, but 
Um, yeah, so that's great. Um, you could use calibration. It probably simplifies a few things. But all the essentials are there for the optimization. Um, I, I don't. I don't have a strong view on it. It's just I don't like people to say, "Oh, I can't run it." You sent me a model. I can't run. No. Good question. Other questions? So when when you say um, you wish more students were here, is that a way of saying listen carefully because this some of this will be on your final exam? <laughs> No, it's just um, it's it's just that the needs I'm talking about here are pretty common ones when you're doing dynamic modeling, and in my lab is is no exception to that. They come up quite a bit because calibrations are very frequently are very frequent, and I think often students, if they don't flail. They don't approach it as as much as a learning opportunity as they should, and um, and they don't approach it with the same inquisitive process that can really track down problems with it quickly and learn from them as they should, and and. Um, it's it's a useful thing if they hear it in the classroom rather than for me having to pair up with each of them for hours and hours and hours, each on their own model, um, uh, having to sort of re restate these, uh, these basic uh, injunctions that I'm teaching. So it's a common need. And in my view, models are learning tools. They're best used as learning tools. And this is one of the place, places that the learning is, is is, is most right for the picking, but it's also, I've discovered, a point where a lot of students in their modeling projects, because this often occurs later in the modeling process, when they are eager to get results from the model and to be able to use it, they often get impatient with that because they feel it's, a, you know, it's just another barrier to the getting a good model. It's, it's just another hurdle to get through to get to their final model. But I would argue in as much as modeling is learning, and for me that's most of the reason why I model, um, this is, this is uh, an opportunity to learn greatly about what this model really represents, what it can do, what it can't do, um, what it's underlying, it's depicting the underlying situation and what is it, what is it, um, how does it interpret situations in the world as suggested by the data. It's, it's, your, it's the chance to come away with not just a model, but with deep learning about that model. And, and that's something that um, I think a lot of students miss. It's, it's that chance to sort of acquire this, to grok the model, to acquire this kind of visceral feel for what's going on in here. And I, I think it's, it's regrettable. When they uh, when they miss it, um, and so I, I wish they will uh, will um, will sort of uh, listen to the injunction to spend more time in it and to try to learn from the experience rather than try to run rush to it. I suppose it's harder to teach the art than the science of the model. Indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> indeed. This is this is true, and I think this is this is part of it. But there's something more to teaching people how to productively approach calibration problems. That's more than simply art. There's certain just like with debugging computer programs or or problems with a computer. There's there's ways that are manifestly fruitful and, and will get you a lot farther. And then there's ways that aren't that fruitful. And you know, I, I don't think it's being unkind to say that a lot of students who, who get into trouble um, in, in, with computers, they, that doesn't sound quite right, but um, students who have trouble with, with um, you know, uh, it, it, not, it not doing what they want it to do, whether it's in calibration or debugging, 
um, they pursue methods which are not so much, um, it's not that they're just inartful, it's that they're, they're, um, they're off base in terms of, of how they're approaching the issue. You know, they flail against it in kind of this inchoate way rather than, than, um, than stepping back and thinking, okay, what does this mean? Um, I have a hypothesis I want to pursue with respect to it. There's some very nice, uh, very nice work that's been done on, on debugging by thinking and kind of hypothesis-driven debugging that also applies to calibration. And it's not so much that you know I acquire some deep, um, mysterious art that I carry with me. I have this gung fu that you know I I use to sort of do things and and somehow <laughs> with awesome touch, you know. A Midas touch, I fix the calibration. It's more, it's more I don't flail. <laughs> and I pursue hypotheses. Okay, what's going on? Let me check if this is the case. Let me check if that's the case. If I don't have a good hypothesis, I'll say, okay, let me, let me at least try to see what it does if I, if I only have it pay attention to this data. And then I learn from that and say, oh, that's interesting. Even if I only tell it to, to learn to match this data, it still won't learn. And it still won't be able to match it, rather. It still won't be able to match it adequately. OK, so um, let me go. It'll shift my attention to other pieces of it. And so it's a systematic process of reflective um, learning that comes during calibration. And it's not so much an art as a combination of, of um, of sort of attitude and um, uh, a combination of, of persistence and um, and uh, openness to learning and uh, a, a confident a self confidence of systematic inquiry um, that's associated with it. And I like to try to teach those attitudes to students, at least they before they leave the vaunted uh, confines of our university but I'm not always successful in imparting those characteristics. So, is that some slides online? Um, good question. I'll, I'll, I'll update them. Um, the, uh, do you mean like, are they with the set that I posted here? Yeah. Um, I can't remember if I've put them there, but um, I will quickly resolve the answer Oh, the, the answer to the affirmative um, uh, in, in, in just a second. Um, okay, I don't know if they were there, but... Uh, oh, really? Oh, okay. That's, 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 that's weird. Okay, they are now. Um, so, so you can take a look at that. Um, you'll also find hours worth of lecture of, of me on calibration. Although I haven't spoken about... I haven't spoken quite with perhaps such vigor about the hypothesis for a couple of years, the hypothesis building and learning from it. Um, and um, in that sense, this is a good, good exchange. But what more questions can I answer about this? Calibration, ladies and gentlemen. What is, yes, yes, Amber. Are there limits to the amount of missing or bad data that you can have? Certainly, there's limits. I, I mean, you know, we, it, 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 it would it'd be a challenge. You won't be able to calibrate effectively, um, you know, a number of parameters if you have too little data. Um, um, so, so you you do need you do need quantities of data at least to measure it with and compatible with how many parameters you're you're trying to estimate. Um, you know, if there's only one data point and you have three parameters. Um, uh, you may get in a situation with multiple interpretations. For a nonlinear model, you're not always going to. I mean, it's not like these are, and this is one of the prejudices we have to be careful about carrying around from reductionist thinking. But sometimes if, if we have three parameters, there's always going to be three interpretations. No, 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 no. These are, these are coupled models. They're tangled together. And maybe there's no good there's no good thing that would allow it to measure that. It's not like, you know, uh, some sort of regression equation where we have more parameters and number of data points, we're going to be able to, 
to you know fit it arbitrarily well. It, it ain't like that. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. Um, it's not like a linear you know um, a linear line we're trying to a match up. Um, but um, uh, but generally you you do need you know quite a bit of data to get identifiability. In other words, to have unique interpretation with. Um, uh, f for a number of parameters, and so missing data can be a problem. There. Bad data, I would, or you know, data that's of lower quality, I would weight that lower. So in other words, I would, you, you would in your objective function, you have, you know, weight one times difference with respect to you know, weight sub a times the difference with respect to a related things between model and empirical data plus weight B times the difference with respect to B related things in the model plus weight C. And I would, I would weight for the less good data, I would give that weight low weight and, and I would set that weight to zero and see if you calibrate some time to see if it's totally whacking out the calibration. You know, if it's, it's just causing it to, to, in, to exhibit distress, computational distress, I would, I would set it to to zero sometime and see how much better it does. Um, but, uh, uh, but uh, you know, in, in general, we're, we're dealing with data. I remember when I graduated from my PhD and I first went into health, I thought I was in heaven because there are these data sets of these giant, I remember surveys in the US, you know, s circulated by ICPSR, which, you know, just had hundreds of thousands of responses to hundreds of questions. It, it was, I thought, this is just awesome. It's, you know, I, I, I just, I, 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 you know, it'll be, be as, <laughs> um, it's, it, you know, it's like, you know, there are these stories of, of, of these, um, uh, you know, these mythical creatures draw, diving into, <laughs> Piles of gold, right? Um, and Shelob's lair, or whatever. Um, uh, and and you know, it's just it was it's just great. It was like chocolatey goodness, um, just you know, flowing all over. And um, and somehow I'm not expressing it quite well. <laughs> it, was, it was it was great. I, I thought this was fantastic. And then and then I, I became an older man sadder man but wiser now um and uh i realized how that those sausages are made <laughs> and and i realized where a lot of this data came from and i realized the shortcomings of this data i remember scientists taking me aside research scientists who had spent most of their professional lives studying tobacco data and saying you're not relying on that data, that question are you are you serious you know that was asked very young professionally by the people in the field. You know, they were inconsistently asking it or something. You don't want to use that. Um, and I'd ask them, well, what data set do you prefer? Well, you know, there's this one, it, but it doesn't have that question. There's this other one that has those two good things, but it's really bad because it has few samples, you know, of poor people. And I was like, oh my God. And, and then I didn't even realize that, I mean, that was only the start. And then I hear, you know, ICD-9, ICD-10 cones for administrative data are often, you know, someone, a woman comes in for an appointment with this uh, doctor and it's about diabetes and, and, and then, you know, she, she leaves, uh, it's about gestational diabetes and, and, you know, she's getting a chat test um, which might reveal she has gestational diabetes and then she goes back and, and the doctor says to the receptionist, hey, enter that, you know, enter that patient appointment. Uh, in and, and the receptionist looks up and like diabetes, I guess. Um, this is a diagnosis of diabetes, and so they enter it in. Now, it's really gestational diabetes, so they eventually it's type two diabetes, and and you get these these errors in data sets because the sausage the sausage factory is not a clean place, and and then a lot of the time the data is not collected. But the data, ladies and gentlemen, the data is backward facing. The data is about the past. The data is about the current data generating process. And what we're often interested in is what the system's gonna do in uncharted territory when we put in place new interventions. So data is great. Data is great to ground models and what's happened and to keep them current with observations. But we gotta always remember that 
Our interests here are broader than that. There are many domains where just looking at data as generated historically is very useful. When you're doing cough recognition, great. When you're doing snoring recognition, great. Because those things aren't likely to ch change much as a result of our policies. But when it comes to data about you know, um, health patterns in the population and so on, um, we have to realize that whilst it's distressing that we'll always be, be relying on data of unseemly character, um, the truth is that, that often our main interests in using these models are to look in spheres where data patterns will be changing in big ways. And in my view, it, there's, so, so my colleague Jack Homer has a very nice term for it, which is not unique to him, but I think he uses it very well. And he talks about false precision. He talks about getting too obsessed with one particular part of the system where you know, you've got to have the very, very best data. But, but your knowledge of the system as a whole and knowledge of other areas of the system is very limited. And, and it's just totally disproportionate attempt to, to, to get the very finest data for this mixed in with, with other stuff that's, that's you know, poorly grounded. And I think that when it comes to models, there's a rule of diminishing returns at some point that, um, that in, in terms of being too sensitive to, uh, to data quality issues, um, that you can't use it to look forward to, to try to understand how, change, how to change the situation. And the fact is, even when the best of models is going to become outdated, the best of models and the best of parameter values, it, the, probably the extra quality for that parameter is going to offer limited overall gain for model outputs. And particularly as we go into regimes which have not been seen before and where the data generating process is going to change, that data um, is no longer going to be high quality, that data. That data is going to be a figment of our past history that, that offers little insight into the future evolution of this system. And so my own, my own sense is that um, it is good to be careful about data. It is good to look for high quality data sources. It is good to be able to, uh, to um, uh, try to aspire to bring new data sources to the table. I told, I told a colleague one time that, that after many years, this was what, 10 years after I began, my, my health modeling journey. <laughs> you could see what I was reduced to. <laughs> Gollum like. Um, um, I, I felt like, I felt like, I told them, I feel like a data buzzard. I go around trying to find scraps here and there of data, sometimes from different jurisdictions that will shed light, sometimes from different time periods, different subpopulations. I'm just scrounging around, looking for little, eking out little bits of sustenance out of the most unseemly carrion carcasses. And I, I told them, I don't want to do that anymore. I want, to, I want to create systems that allow me to collect higher quality data. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that utterance, perhaps, was the first big inception to the Ethica project. <laughs> I want to say, I don't want to be a buzzard anymore. I want, to, I want to be able to craft, I want to be able to craft my own farm to grow my own data and, and collect data that, that's of suitable quality that I don't feel ashamed consuming it with my models. Now, not everyone has these aspirations, nor everyone this sense of their positioning by um, uh, uh, buzzard-like, um, uh, uh, you know, a vulnerable vulture. Um, but the truth is, we work in an imperfect world 
where often extra data and certain fronts uh, provides uh, provides little additional little additional uh, benefit, and uh, and we have to we have to watch out for the allure for the for the for the um, uh, sort of unrealistic allure of putting all our efforts into really high quality data for certain parts of a model where it's not commensurate with the model needs nor the the other elements of the model which which don't measure up. So I think I think do your darndest, don't do your damnedest on the data front. Mm. That's that's sort of my my view. Other questions though? Okay. Um, time, time draws onwards. Our time together, ladies and gentlemen, is drawing to a close. I'll make some closing remarks because I I don't want to leave you 